Today I'm here with Brian John, who tell us a little of the history of the old Flyers group. Now, this is 2013 and it's the 10th anniversary year of the founding of the old Flyers group at Janicott in Western Australia. In fact, March this year marks the 100th occasion that these group of like-minded individuals have met for lunch and to hear stories from speakers on a wide range of subjects, most of them aviation related, and uh, those particularly relating to Western Australia. So we're going to have a talk to Brian John. Where were you born and what or who were your first influences? Be as honest as you can. Well, I was born in Perth, actually, but my parents were at a farm mm. at Boddington. My father came to Boddington in 1922. In the first, he was Welsh, actually, he came from Pembroke in uh, West Wales. A family of nine, eight boys and one girl. Mm. Uh, th three of his brothers, uh, I think three of his brothers were in the Tenth Light Horse. Mm. Two of them were killed at the war, but they were in the British Army. And he had one sister. Mm. And uh, she she came out about 1912. They all came out sort of before the First World mm. War. So your dad would have been a, a big influence on your life at that early stage. Oh yes. Yeah. yes. But where, where where did your early interest in flying start? Well, yeah. um, I was standing outside the house one day, yeah. and this aeroplane flew over, and it was when I was five years old. Wow. And I said something to my parents about, it and they said, mm. "Oh, it's uh, so and so." And his sister mm. lives at Maradon, which is just south of Boddington, and he's, mm. he, he lives in Canberra. Mm. He's, in the, he's in the Air Force, uh, permanent mm. Air Force, and he's flown down to circle around to show his uh, sister. Yeah, and that was five years of age. So when, when did you actually begin age. your flying training? At what point did you decide that could be a good thing to do? Um, well, yeah. um, when I was about 19 or 20, I remember my father was milking yeah. the cow one day, one night rather, and uh, I said, uh, Dan, I'm going to learn to fly. And so the Aero Club had yeah. a scholarship on, flying ah. scholarship. Mm. And this was when I was about 20. Mm. And uh, of course, the women got uh, uh, flying training for nothing, but mm. that wasn't the point. Uh, and you got go it. Down, there we go. No, I didn't win that. Yeah. But, uh, you know, they. Uh, but it set your mind to thinking. But the, the pilots, uh, mm. that they had tr the, hon the honorary pilots, mm. were fellows that had been in the Air Force. Mm. No, they were so handsome. And they'd all <laughs> been flying mosquitoes up in the island during the war. Yeah. And um, this particular one, he, mm. he'd gone back to university studying um, uh, uh, dentistry. Mm. Mm. But um, he, he only did it for a little while and he joined in the mains. Mm. And spent the rest of his life flying uh, for them. Mm. But he took me up for this first flight and they put me in a sloppy old uh, leather helmet on. <laughs> And uh, I thought it was going to blow off, and uh, they did the harness up. <laughs> and we went up, and um, uh, he asked me to do some turns and all these sort of things. And then at the end of the day, he said what he would have been paid to say to everyone, you wouldn't be very hard to teach to learn. Because <laughs> 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 well, he wants to not. <laughs> encourage training. <laughs> yes. So anyway, that's, um, that's how I started. So yep. that was in... That was about October 47, mm. so I waited till the end of country week uh, 48, mm. which is in February, and then I went out to Marlins now. Mm. That was where it trained, and that was uh, quite, an, quite a... So the usual target muscles and the like? Oh yeah, that's all they yeah. had. That's all they had. They, didn't have, they, any, had. they didn't have anything uh, else except target moths. Mm. So you, you were making your living on the farm then, though? Oh yes, but uh, I was like a lot of people. Yeah. Um, Horry mm. Miller's daughter. She was mm. doing a nursing training at Royal Perth where Vivian trained, mm. and she was on about three pounds a week. And I was on about three good pounds money a in 1947. Two, no, no yeah. it wasn't very good money at all. <laughs> when you said me, um, I, I could mm. only afford to fly like mm. she uh, once every three weeks. Mm. So I used to catch the bus down on a, fly on a Saturday morning, mm. and uh, like a lot of country fellows. I was in one of those organisations, in this case it was the Boozy Buffs. Mm. And the Boozy Buffs had an accommodation place just around the start of Stirling Street, you know where the Sunday Times yep. is? Well, it was the yep. Boozy Buffs place and that yep. was accommodation that was $6 a night. Like they used to say, if God had meant us to fly, he would have given us deeper, poly uh, deeper wallets, <laughs> bigger wallets. <laughs> So that's where I, so I used to catch the bus yeah. out to um, Maylands and this is on a Saturday after I got down the bus mm -hmm. and then I'd go home on Monday morning. Wow. 
But then you were telling me uh, some time ago that you were involved in aerial photography and then you set up your aerial tourism business in the outback of Australia and Southern Africa. That's a big step from flying tiger moths. Well, the first problem I had was mm. that uh, I couldn't pass a medical because mm. I had an eye problem. Right. Um, and they said, you'll never ever, get, never ever mm. be able to get a commercial license because of this problem, mm. because you won't be able to land an aeroplane. Anyway, this was 48. Yeah. Uh, in 65, they wrote to me and said uh, that um, we will give mm. you a commercial license, mm. except it will, we won't give you an AT, ATPL, mm. uh, but you can have a commercial license. So I, I did the correspondence course mm. um, with the College of Knowledge, as it was known in Melbourne, mm. which was a fantastic um, correspondence course. Mm. And I passed my private life, well I've done that before the private license mm. probably, because the thing I was concerned about mm. was that my knowledge of theory of flight was, and so on was so minute yeah. that I knew it was inevitable that I was going to kill myself. Wow. So I needed to yep. get knowledge yep. into my head yep. Yep. so that I could avoid that situation. Yep. Well, that's so that's how I, I got my commercial license and, mm. uh, um, and, and the reason that happened was that the Narrington Flying Club came mm. to me one day and uh, I was sent this fellow to see me and they said, um, we're desperately short of uh, getting instructors at Narogen. Mm. Um, uh, we, we just wonder if you'd, if you'd think about um, doing a commercial mm. and then doing an instructor writing. Oh. So I said, all right, I'll do that. Mm. So I was halfway through my instructor writing mm. and um, they got a chap across from New Zealand. Um, so- Cut the rug out from underneath it, your feet. It did. And yeah. then uh, he was there a couple yeah. of years, two or three years, and then mm. he got John Douglas. Yeah. And of course John Douglas. Who was known to us both. Yeah, he had yeah. flying schools from Muck and Boot and yeah. down to Cranbrook <laughs> and out to Hyden. <laughs> so uh, I, uh, that's how I got into it. And the said John Douglas uh, was the examiner when I went for my uh, navigation mm. for the BPL. Mm. But that was how I got yeah. into uh, doing air tours. Wow. And the first ones I started mm. doing, well I did the first one mm. I did, with a, was a, with a group from Boddington, we went mm. up to the Pilgrim. That was yeah. when it was just starting. And for instance, Tom mm. Price, which I've always regarded as being the nicest town in the north, right. uh, at that stage had yeah. two telephones, two public telephones for 2,000 people. Good grief. That's how basic it was. Yes, not much has changed. <laughs> <laughs> it has everyone's got telephone there. <laughs> and then um, um, I, I was. Um, thinking what else could I do and uh, I decided to do the trips to Alice Springs mm. and at that stage of course the two tens had come in mm. and then of course in the 60s mm. there was it was a great boom in mm. WA it was yep, developed absolutely. the iron ore industry yep. up there in Pilbara yep. and there were so many aeroplanes yep. you can't believe it mm. any aeroplane you wanted you could get at well. Jandicott because they were so busy mm. and so there were Cherokee sixes and two tens yep. and the whole range wow. and that's how I started. Yeah. Um, and I worked out yeah. uh, that I could um, uh, get to Ayers Rock yeah. in about six and a half hours in the 210. So right. I used to leave about two o'clock Sunday afternoon to fly to Leonora yeah. and we'd stay at this hotel. Mm. And the beauty of that, that mm. was mm. that uh, it was the hotel that also had... That wasn't Herbert Hoover. Herbert Hoover, Herbert Hoover. Herbert Hoover. Yes. Herbert Hoover that's right. Yeah. No, was, and so he was a manager at Gorya. Mm. Mm. So his furniture is still there in that dining room in a, in a similar, similar situation mm. at Mount Magnet. Good grief. So we used to stay the night there, mm. and then the next morning we'd fly into Ayers Rock, which was mm. about uh, three and a half hours, I think. Now what were you flying around in South Africa then? What, what, whatever was available? Oh no, when we mainly flew two tens. Two tens, yeah. that, yeah. yeah. Just the two tens. Occasionally we had a Cherokee 6. So you've had a long association with Janicot Airport, so at oh, least well, uh, 50 yeah. years. Mm. Oh, yeah, because yeah. I've been flying for 60 years. Yeah, mm. I can recall. Mm. See, we were at, um, at Mayland, and so mm. we shifted to Perth. Mm. And we operated off Perth mm. Airport. Mm. And uh, I, I recall a friend mm. of mine named Terry Archer mm. saying to me one day, What about we going for a flight, Brian? And this mm. was in the chipmunks. They yes. come in then. Yep. Uh, graduated from. Which are still flying at the Aero Club? Yes. But mm. they had a whole fleet of them. Mm. And he said, Let's go down and have a look at the new strip down at uh, Jandicott. Mm. And then, of course, we got in the air and we could see this uh, patch of white yes. in the distance, yeah. which is sad. <laughs> completely surrounded by bush, yeah. not a mile, not a house within miles of it. No. And we got down, and of course, this is where they're preparing Jandicott. 
And now Janet Cott is surrounded by suburbs and, yes. and uh, industry uh, who complain about the noise. Mm. That's uh, banks down all over again. Mm. So um, bringing you forward a, a great deal, this t 10 years ago, October the 28th, 2003, the late Hal Sutton and late Roy Hamilton and a few friends, you had lunch at the Royal Era Club and somehow or other the, the idea was came up that you would uh, loosely form this old flyers group. How, what was the genesis of that? Who, who had the idea? What was what were think thoughts at that time? Well, yeah. I, I, I should probably uh, go back mm. uh, and talk about Hal Sutton. For yes, yes. Uh, I, I was yeah. involved in starting mm. the. Uh, a found, I was a founder member of the Narrative and Writing Club. Yeah. Along with Hal and Sutton, yeah. and uh, I actually started instructing on my second solo flight. Right. Wow. Was, uh, and you're supposed to have 70 hours. Oh, sure. Then. Yeah. Um, so I did. But Narrison's a long way from Casa. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I still had. Uh, mm. I think I had a commercial license then. I'm not sure. But anyway, mm. Hal Sutton from here mm. uh, was a founder member also. Mm. And um, so um, Hal, uh, Hal and I. Hal always told the story of how I saved his life because he was. He'd been in the Air Force during mm. the war, and then after the war, mm. he, uh, he stayed on in the Air Force. Now, they had 3,000 acres across the other side of the river, mm. as you probably know. Uh, mm. And they, he and his brother Tony, mm. they developed Hall's Head, but they still had the rest. And there was mm. a, a big paddock uh, straight across the river, mm. um, and you, you follow the road around to the right, and there was, a, there was an old gate leading into a paddock. It was a cow paddock. And um, I did scenic flights out of there for eight years wow. during Kenyana. Yeah. And Hal Sutton, of course, owned it. So okay. he, he used to uh, bring his glide down there sometimes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, was, I was using Cherokee yeah. 6, and we used to have a rope trailing out the back, and someone sitting in the back seat <laughs> holding it, hooked on to Hal, who was 50, 50 yards behind. I'd tow him up, and then he'd release, and we'd pull the rope in, <laughs> and he'd go off flying. Oh, sometimes he'd 10 or 15 miles out to sea, and then you'd come back. And wow. Anyway, um, Hal used to, Hal was learning to fly. He was absolutely besotted, besotted mm. with flying. He just mm. loved it. And he used to get up there and he'd get into a turn and uh, mm. um, uh, and he'd be turning away and he'd be completely oblivious mm. to his very low airspeed. Wow. We, were always, we were always saying, get your nose down, Hal, yeah. you're going to a store and so on. Yeah. And you know, we all did that. Anyway, this particular day, I looked at mm. my alternator and we were 1,200 feet and we were straight out of the top of the Narrowton airstrip. Mm. So I thought, well, I'll just let him go and he'll find out what will happen when he glides too slow. So he's down to 35 and 35 yeah. and all of a sudden his top wing stalled and we flipped over and we're in a spiral dive. And he's sitting there, just frozen. Yeah, yeah. And, he, and we spun about three times and he said, what's happened? Yeah. And I said, I've got control, Hal. Yeah. And I applied opposite rudder, and pulled it out of yeah. the spin. Yeah. And I said, We've, how many times have we told you mm. that that, mm. was, that is what Lucky you've got the height to recover. Well, I, we wouldn't, yeah. I wouldn't let him do it. Yeah. yeah. If we didn't, if we had 1,200 feet. Mm. Plenty of height. Mm. So I, otherwise, I wouldn't have done it. Mm. I let, it's very necessary, and you'd recognise this, mm. it's very necessary sometimes to let people make a mistake. Oh, sure. So that they can realise yep. uh, the, the circumstances of leading, of doing leading into it and, and, the, and how you get out of it. Exactly. Yep. Now, mm. Hal never, ever forgot that. Mm. He said, Brian John saved my life. Wow. And that was true. Mm. That was absolutely true. Mm. And because I let him do it, but mm. then I was in a position to yep, pull it out. To save it. Yeah. yeah. And so that's very important. Yeah. So Hal then, uh, he was wealthy enough to have his own glider and his mm. own glider and so on. Mm. But um, he became a very, very safe pilot. Mm. And that was a direct result of him getting into a spin. Now, later on, uh, there was a club out at, uh, out at Coolman. Mm. And they used, to, they used to spend 11 months a year getting their glider ready to, to fly. And then they'd fly for one weekend sort of thing. Oh. And at this particular time, they came over to uh, Narrington mm. uh, Strip. And I took the chief pilot up for a flight and, um, and he hadn't flown for a year but the only mm. thing was I said mm. to him that your approach was perfect but because you hadn't flown for six or eight months it was too perfect. Yes. You should really have stood in a bit closer to make sure that you could make it yeah, yeah. rather than doing a perfect back. approach Yes. because you might have done a perfect approach. And this was in the glider? This was in the glider. Right. Um, now the next yeah. day, and I wasn't there then, mm. Um, he went up 
with uh, another young bloke, one, mm. of, one of my students, who was only about 18, mm. and they turned crosswind and they went into a spin and wow. the plane crashed and the young guy was killed and, he, and this bloke from Coolin was bound yeah. into It's unforgiving. Yes. Unforgiving. The laws of physics that can't be disobeyed. That's right. Now, there, there you are, Hal Sutton and, and Roy Hamilton and yourself. Well, Roy Coolin. Hamilton. Mm. Roy Hamilton, I met him, I think I met him. Um, I was um, unmating an mm. aircraft up at Cullinara once and this chap came up mm. to me and introduced himself and said he was Roy Hamilton and he said, mm. I'm, uh, I'm the, I've been the, I built the two dams here and then I mm. was the uh, administrator of the Kimberley and now since I've retired I, I love the Kimberley, mm. I don't want to live anywhere else, so he said, he said I bought 10 hectares of uh, uh, land oh. on the western banks and I put in 700 mango trees. Oh. Of course, being an engineer, yeah. Brian, yeah. he said they're all on uh, time time irrigation. Yes, and of course. course. I don't need to be there. No. So that gives me time to be the secretary of the uh, of the uh, community club and all these other jobs. If you see those mangoes up in the Kununurra now, yes. unbelievably yes. healthy and big. Yes. Yeah. He, um, uh, moved down to Perth mm. because he'd got uh, the mesothelioma. Yep. Because when he was in heaven, they sent him down to mm. Whitnoom to put in a water supply. Mm. And 50 years later, mm. and so um, uh, they this is sometime after, mm. and they decided to move down to Perth mm. because his wife would then be near her family. Yeah, sure. And uh, he only had you know mm. a certain amount of time to live. Mm. So that was how he came yeah. down. And then so how sudden. Yeah. Um, who lived here, but he mm. also had a very nice unit near mm. the Main Street Jetty. Mm. So I used to see him pretty regularly. Mm. And we used to often go and have lunch. And this particular time, he mm. and Roy and I went to lunch. And then while we were having it, Hal said, how about we go out there? I'll come for lunch. I've got a nice restaurant. Yeah. So uh, the three of us went out and we got two more. Mm. That made five of us. Plus mm. um, a chap who um, had a very big very mm. big share breaking business, he and his brother. Mm. Um, they, they uh, I just can't think of his name, except that during the war he was a group captain mm. in charge of the RFD, uh, in charge of the Empire Flying Training Scheme. Wow. Um, Should they be able to track Kool, him down? He came from Kulawani Street yep. now. Yep. Um, but um, he was about six foot four. He and his brother, mm. they had both been fast bowlers in the Sheffield Shield Creek team. Mm. And so he came and so we were sitting at the table while we'd been down. I was sitting at this end and he was sitting at the other end and John Douglas was there and mm. um, Roy and uh, a couple of others. Yeah. It was about five and that's how it started. Wow. Simple as that. So it was just a, just a group of friends yeah. getting together, having lunch yeah. and talking about aviation yeah. as we all do when you know pilots get together. Yeah. Yeah. And then a few more joined the next yeah. month and yeah. then yeah. Well, 100 meetings on. Well, it's, it is 100 coming up in March. That's right. And uh, I mean, you must feel very proud to be part of that. To you know, I only came in on the scene about two years ago, mm. and and I think it's just wonderful the way, not just the uh, the social aspect, which is good enough, mm. but the aviation stories are just mind-boggling. Oh, so, where, but where do you see this going? That's the thing. If we, the well, next generation has got to take it up and run with it. Well, it's an increase. One of the things I'm pleased about is mm. that there are an increasing number of women coming in. True. For, yeah. a, for a long time, there weren't any women. No, no. To, like I mentioned, um, nurses, and yes, and so on. But uh, now there's more and more. Yeah, hostesses in. and yes. well, the uh, women less, now are pilots. Who would think? There's less and less yeah. uh, uh, wartime people because they're getting too old. Yes, yeah. You know, they're all in their nineties now. That's right. And so mm. uh, it's just GA people. And retired yeah. airline pilots. And, so often, as, and it, as a matter of fact, at the yeah. last meeting, mm. a retired Air Vice Marshal came up to me and mm. said how much he enjoyed it. Well, yeah. Well, and he was only youngish. Yep. So, um, of course, when we say 100 meetings, that two meetings, two speakers a meeting, that's 200 speakers. Some give more than one talk, of course. But how, in your opinion, do you? stimulate people to want to get up and tell their story. What's your trick to it? Well, not everyone wants to. For instance, uh, getting people to move mm. about things, I like to rotate it around as much as I can. Okay, I sure. Like, I don't like it to have the same person do yeah, it. Yeah, I've noticed that. John Wager does it. Yeah. But it's because um, 
uh, a lot of people don't want to get up. No. It's as simple as that, and you can't insist mm. that they do. No, sure. Um, and some of these people I've known for years, mm. and they still mm. don't want to get up. Well, yeah. I, I went down to talk to uh, Michael's, you know, mm. oh, he was a narrative writing club like, um, mm. He was sitting at the end of the table. I looked up. Mm. Now twenty narrative and gliding people yeah, were sitting yeah, in one table. I remember that. So we've got the same. Yep. The the narrative and gliding club mm. by numbers is mm. the most uh, productive of mm. anyone that's come. Well, and that's what I'm, I'm very I've, proud I've of. bought two occasions. I've bought guests who I would think when I when they arrived would just sit down and they wouldn't know anyone. But the one that stood out for me was Hugh Warden. Who knew half the people in the room? Yeah, I used to drive up from Bollington mm. uh, for meetings. No one can sort of um, put a pencil on mm. why it's grown so much and why it's so... Uh, because it doesn't exist mm. anywhere in the world. No. But the thing that mm. always uh, sticks in my mind mm. is the number of things that have started here in Western Australia, and this place is a classic example. Yes. They don't have these in the Eastern States. No, no, I, I, no, I know. It was the Air Force yeah. people came back. That's the Air Force Association retirement villages. Yep. Yep. Yeah, well, West Australia leads the world again. Well, that's that's literally <laughs> true. And, well, Brian, well, I want to thank you for um, coming and being so well, um, forthcoming with your with your stories. Um, it's been an absolute delight. And, and um, more power to you and uh, and your group of friends. Thank you. Well, thanks, <laughs> thanks very much for inviting me. Thank you.